Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Wildemar Beach Congregational Church. I'm Mary Claire Hansen. Everybody is so joyful today. It's very loud in here before we decided to start the service here. So, it, yeah, either espresso or spring fever. I don't know. It looks like we're finally going to get some spring, but we keep getting rain. So. We need the rain. Yeah, we need the rain, Anthony. Yeah, all the, the rivers are overflowing their banks, so I hope everybody's been safe. Um, so a few announcements for this morning. First, uh, please pay attention to our prayer list this week for members and friends of the congregation. Um, Paula has given me a note here that the Easter flowers, I can't believe we're watering Easter flowers, envelopes are available in front of the altar. On the, on the ledge there, Paula? Yes. Okay, on the ledge. Um, they are due by Sunday the 17th, which is next week. So if you would like to submit in memory of or in honor of, please make sure you have them submitted by next Sunday. Um, and it's okay to submit your order online. and pay, or It's just submit the envelope empty and then pay later. Okay, so if you don't, if you've, Come back next Sunday and you say, oh, I forgot the envelope. Just fill out the envelope and put it in the collection plate, and then you can pay it another date. Okay? Um, we still need uh, hosts and hostesses for fellowship. The sign-up is out on the board. Um, the past few weeks, we haven't had anybody sign up, but it's like loaves and fishes around here, just like our uh, kitchen says. People are always uh, providing meals. But not only do we need hosts and hostesses to provide food, but we need someone who's available for cleanup, maybe some break uh, and set up if they're available. So it's not just about bringing food. So even if you can't bring food and you just want to help with cleanup or with setup, you know, please sign up on the board and then just let us know your intention. You know, we we everybody works together here. Um, and which is wonderful, um, and it's so, such a joyful time. I always look forward to our time of fellowship. Also, the Easter basket donations are due next Sunday um, for the deacons. Um, Clint, is it six, still six families we're providing for? Seven. Seven? Okay. So um, there are still spaces available on that list. Um, if all the spaces do not get filled, Clint, um, just, you know, get what needs to be uh, purchased, and then Paula can reimburse. Okay. Okay. The church council meeting is tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock um, here at the church. So if you have not submitted a report and you have a report for the board, please submit that report via the email that was sent out this week so that everybody can see it, um, the board can see it, before we have our meeting tomorrow at 7 the Easter egg hunt is in two weeks. Um, we have over 2,600 eggs filled and ready for the event. So thank you to everybody who... What time? At 11 o'clock. Okay. It's always at 11. Okay. Um, we yeah, we need yeah, people here by 9 to help set up. Um, I thank everybody who signed up to volunteer already. Um, and if, even if you can just give us 30 minutes, please uh, sign up on the board. Um, but we, I thank everybody who donated um, all the candies and all the other little fillings for, for the eggs, and uh, we greatly appreciate it. And please pay attention to the remaining items that are com coming for Lent and Easter. Birthdays for this week. Helen LaPlante has a birthday. Today's the day. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you have lots of good things planned today, Clint. <laughs> Sarah Nath is her birthday this week. Bob Ralston. Wendy, your husband's birthday is this week. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> and Mary Ann Nolan has a birthday this week. Amen. You're born on the Ides of March. You know what they say about the Ides of March, don't you? Beware the eyes of March. <laughs> so happy birthday to everybody. Are there any, oh wait, I have one more uh, thing here. Um, Kathy Poe brought this from um, Bridgeport Rescue Mission. Uh, had left it for Pastor Ken. Um, it's a thank you note 
um, to the congregation and to Kathy um, from the women's group. Thank you all so very much for your generous donations of yarn. They are already being used in our new projects and there is plenty of skeins to hold us over for a while. Many thanks to all, fondly, Kim. So thank you to everybody who donated uh, yarn to um, Bridgeport Rescue Mission and Kathy's group, that's wonderful. Okay, now are there any other announcements? If not, let's please prepare our hearts for worship. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to an hour earlier. I feel rushed this morning for some reason, and I don't know why. Would you please all stand and join with me in the call to worship? I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. And we'll start by singing hymn number 35, We Will Glorify. Lovely, lovely song. Please now join me in the prayer of invocation in your bulletin. Our Father, we thank you that your mercies are still upon us and that your love wraps us round about. We bless you for the joy of existence and for every beautiful thing you have put in our lives. You have set beauty in all the world about us and you seek us through every sense we have. We bless you for the exceeding riches of your grace and your kindness towards us. We ask you to be with us in our worship of you, that blessings may abound. Amen. You may be seated. I always say you may be. You don't have to be seated. You can stand up the whole service if you like. Please join in the prayer of confession. Lord, we seek to be free 
but we have imprisoned ourselves by our sinfulness. We have allowed our righteous intentions to be entangled with the snares of evil. We have given in so easily and done that which was easy, convenient, tempting, and sinful. Father, forgive us. Enable us to realize that only in obedience to your will may we ever find freedom. Hear now our silent prayers of confession, for which we ask your pardon and forgiveness. Still not on. Is it on now? There you go. It's on now. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Anthony. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. Well, it's a wonderful nine o'clock service this morning. Yes. <laughs> Hour early. And then uh, Beatrice is throwing us off. She's sitting back there this morning. <laughs> Max. It was full over there. It was full over there. The, the last, you know, in a little while, they were all sitting over here. Now they shifted over there. Okay. <laughs> Always something going on here at the church. All right. So I'm looking forward to Easter, starting to make plans for Holy Week, which is also early voting week. <laughs> like we really need that. But anyway, uh, we certainly need Holy Week. And leading up to uh, Palm Sunday, which is, of course, our mini musical and mini message. So, plan to invite somebody. We have that postcard, another postcard going out to like 6,000 some homes in the area. So, uh, we picked up some folks last year because of that. So, we're hoping that uh, we can reach some other new folks. So, in the next couple of weeks, 
Dave, do you have any idea when the postcard is going to arrive? They got to ours for yesterday, so. Maybe this week. Maybe this week. So be on the lookout for some people that are coming into this church and uh, church building and don't look like they've been here before. Give them a friendly greeting. Go up and introduce yourself and uh, help them find a place to be seated. If they're looking for uh, facilities, we, we have those now in very fine order. And so uh, looking forward to Holy Week, Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, no Bible study that week, Monday, Thursday, and then uh, sunrise service. Now, sunrise is if there's going to be a sunrise. If it's, uh, if it's raining like some of this rain, we, yes, that's inclement weather we don't have. Well, we do have the breakfast. We always have the breakfast. That's not a problem. All right. So that's uh, following the sunrise service if we're able to have it. And then, of course, the 10 o'clock service. So we continue our worship now through our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. thine own, whatever the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone. A trust, O Lord, from thee.
let everybody get situated. <laughs> Thank you so much, choir. That was beautiful. We're going to read today from Joshua. I guess that has something to do with the song, right? <laughs> and we're going to read, uh, let me find this, Joshua 6, verses 12 to 21. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord passed on, blowing the trumpets continually. The armed men went before them, and the rear guard came up after the ark of the Lord, while the trumpets blew continually. On the second day, they marched around the city once, and then returned to the camp. They did this for six days. On the seventh day, they rose early at dawn and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it shall be devoted to the Lord for <clears throat> destruction. I have to pause for a second here. 21, sorry. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in the house shall live because she did, hid the messengers we sent. As for you, keep away from the things devoted to destruction so as not to covet and take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel an object for destruction, bringing trouble upon it. But all silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted, and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpets, they raised a great shout, and the wall fell down flat, so that the people charged straight ahead into the city captured it. Then they devoted to destruction by the edge of the sword all in the city, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys. May God add his blessing and, of course, his understanding to this reading. All right, yes, so now we know why we had that stirring operatory to that uh, reading. We continue our series of messages on faith. And today, we have three more examples of faith. Actually, it's going to be four. After Moses, the author of Hebrews gives us three more examples of faith on the part of the Israelites as they exited Egypt after 400 years of bondage and then headed back to Canaan, the promised land. Reading in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 29. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. When the Egyptians, that's the army, tried to do so, follow them, they were drowned. So we pick up where we left off last Sunday. Moses as he was directed by God, held out his staff, same staff that he used when he was doing all those plagues that were brought upon the Egyptians trying to get Pharaoh to release the, Egyptians, the Israelites to be able to go back to Israel. By the way, um, this is, by the way, is not a, um, it, it's, it's not a special sub. Jersey Mike's, but uh, <laughs> well, you have to understand that this this staff is three thousand years old. Okay, but I was able on one of my trips to Israel. A Bedouin came over to me and said he had Moses' staff. He did, and for ten shekels. I was able to get Moses' staff. <laughs> and I had to sneak it out because the Israeli antiquities would have wanted this if they could have got it. 
But here's Moses' staff that he used to hold out, and the water of the Red Sea parted. You can go up and see it afterwards. <laughs> How's that, Jim? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, so we're reading in uh, Exodus chapter 14. And the passage in Hebrews just gives one verse to this. So there's a whole lot more in the book of, of Exodus. It says that um, here the Israelites were leaving Egypt coming up to the Red Sea and behind them the Egyptian army because Pharaoh he said to himself and to his other people we can't let these people go they're, they're doing our work they're our servants they're doing our slaves so he had a change of heart the Bible says and so he gathered up all the chariots that was the tanks of the day and uh, went chasing after the Israelites. So here's the situation. In front of them is a Red Sea. Behind them coming up is the Egyptian army. They appear to be trapped. The faith of Moses, responding to the direction from God, enabled the Israelites to escape. It was Moses' faith, no doubt, that inspired the people <coughs> that they had to walk or rush through the Red Sea that it piled up, it says, on the right and on the left. Now you might say, well, it sounds like it was pretty much uh, Moses' faith, but we can also say it was faith on the part of the people because if you were faced with that situation, having to walk through water piled up on either side, which, by the way, when it did come down, it drowned the whole Egyptian army, so it did take faith, and that's why the writer of Hebrews is commending the people, not just Moses, for they're having faith to pass through the Red Sea. They were fleeing the Egyptians, the Egyptian army, and they were looking to be delivered across the Red Sea. And it says that uh, they did so on dry land. When God does something, he does it right. Even the ground that they were passing over was dry. So faith enabled Moses and the children of Israel to escape Egypt, passing through the Red Sea. Now picture yourself in this situation. Do you ever feel trapped, hemmed in, in a situation? What you need is faith to move forward. To move forward, following the direction of of God, trusting him to hold back the things that are you're feeling trapped with and delivering you uh, to promised land. Now, there's another example, by the way, and this is not mentioned here in Hebrews, but it certainly is in the Old Testament, of how when they came into Canaan, something similar happened. Now, most people are familiar with the story about the parting of the Red Sea. And it was a Red Sea, not a Reed Sea. It was the Red Sea. God stopped the Jordan River as they were about to enter Canaan. When it was at flood stage, and by the whip walk is at flood stage lately, with all this rain. And you can read about this in Joshua chapter 3, verse 7 to verse 17. So, skipping over to the book of Joshua in the third chapter. It says that um, Joshua had the priests who were carrying the ark to come down to the river there over on the eastern side. All the people are gathered up behind them. And you notice it says something very interesting. When they came to the river and it was at flood stage, God caused the river to stop, and it piled up. And 
again, they were able to cross over in dry land. But notice this. It wasn't until their feet touched the water that the river stopped. You know, we, we want to see things before it happens. But that's not faith. Faith is believing it before you see it. So here's all these Israelites, the priests carrying the ark, very sacred to them. And uh, Joshua's telling them they're going to cross the river and the guy's going to stop it. And they're like, uh, okay. He tells them, all right, get ready. We're going to go over. It wasn't until the priest's feet touched the water that the water's part. So the next time you're faced with a difficult situation, you're waiting for God to bring some kind of answer, move forward, trusting him to part the water. If you really feel God is directing you to do something, if he's directing you to do that, you can have confidence indeed that the way is going to be made for you to do that. When their feet touched the water's edge, that's when the river stopped, even at full flood stage, and they were able to pass over the Jordan River. And now what they're facing with, of course, is Jericho. Jericho. So we come to the next verse where it says, The Israelites, under the leadership of Joshua, Moses' successor, actually crossed the Jordan River. And now they're facing this walled city. And here's a bunch of nomads that have been traveling around Sinai for 40 years, facing a walled city. Jericho, by the way, very interesting city. It's thought to be the oldest continually inhabited city on the face of the earth. It goes back 7,000 B.C. Now, that's with this 2,000 years since 9,000 years of civilization. It's located on a trade route. And uh, you can go there, by the way, and you can find where Catherine Kenyon, who was a very early archaeologist, um, did some excavations. There's a couple of different Jerichos. There's the Old Testament Jerichos, and then there's the New Testament Jericho that that Herod built. And that's where, in the story of Jesus passing through and uh, the blind man and all that, it says that they were, he was entering Jericho and he was leaving Jericho. Well, how can you be entering Jericho, leaving Jericho? Now, you could do that with Debbie's hometown. Uh, coming to Keysel Town and leaving Keysel Town was on one sign. Small, small place, you understand. But, uh, it, <laughs> but Jericho, there are several Jerichos. There's an old Jericho. In there, and it's actually, uh, Jericho is going back Got that look. 7,000 years. <laughs> they, they actually had, uh, uh, the lights were going to uh, go off at 9 o'clock at night. Yeah. And, uh, on that, but that was waking people up, so they had to stop doing that. Anyway, um, here they are. They're facing this walled city. And what do we read about this? It says, um, as they came to this walled city, Joshua was given instructions of how to proceed. Now, one day he's out walking, and he sees a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword. And Joshua went up to him and asked, and says, are you for us or are with our enemies? Neither, he says, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have come now. So Joshua fell down. The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for this place is holy land. By the way, the question is not whether uh, God is on our side, but are we on the Lord's side? He's the commander of the armies of the Lord. And he instructs Joshua how to proceed. And he tells him to get the people. Now they're across the river and they're going to march around the walls of Jericho. They did this for six days, marching around the city. Now, meanwhile, the people in Jericho, they see this whole horde of people, kind of like what we're seeing on the news lately. This whole mass of people. And they got, they're in their, they're in their city, and they got the gates all locked up and all this, but... Uh, Six days, these people are walking around, and they go back to the camp, walking around back to the camp. It, it sort of was uh, kind of like psychological warfare in a sense, wasn't it? You know, 
But on the seventh day, they walked around seven times. And the priests are blowing a horn. The people gave a great shout. And down came the walls of Jericho. Now, I mentioned uh, Catherine Kenyon. And one of her archaeological things, she found the walls of Jericho. And you can go there and look down and see the walls of Jericho. And somebody said, well, if I said the walls of Jericho fell down. Well, keep in mind, there were a number of different Jerichos. And certainly over 9,000 years now, 7,000 years going back, whatever, there was a lot of different walls. So if somebody finds a wall, that doesn't mean that the wall didn't fall down. It was no doubt rebuilt. And uh, whatever. So uh, on the seventh day, they went around seven times. And then the trumpets were blown. People gave a grouch, great shout. And here's again a faith on the part of the people. I mean, this never happened before. Faith on the part of the people to do what Joshua is telling them to do. And indeed, this great miracle took place on the seventh day, and the walls came down. Now, one day in <laughs> Eastern Mennonite Seminary, you understand this is a peace church, pacifists, um, and pacifists have a hard time with some of the stuff in the Old Testament. You know, it doesn't seem like that Jesus is a loving person and all that, that uh, some of the things. That, so um, one, one professor said, well, you know, you might say that God called the walls of Jericho to fall down, but it was that Israelite spear that did me in. <laughs> and that's, uh, of course, uh, exactly what happened. So, when you hear the sound of the blast, Joshua told the people, give a shout. The walls will come down and collapse, and the people will go in straight in, we read in Hebrews. This is exactly how it happened. As the trumpet sounded, the people shouted, great shout, down came the walls. And every man charged straight forward and took the city. That's how the Israelites conquered the walled city of Jericho. So, my friends, do you ever find yourself facing walls, things that are blocking you as you're attempting to move forward under the direction of the Lord? Well, keep in mind that if indeed God directed you to do something, in his time, the walls will come down. And you will be able to proceed through some opening that he has provided. Now, there's another very interesting side story, this whole, whole matter about the fall of the walls of Jericho. And this is how it happened. You have to go back a couple of chapters in Joshua. He sends out two spies. Remember, uh, he was part of the spies that Moses sent in, and uh, two of the spies... Joshua, and who was the other one? Anybody remember? Caleb? Okay. Uh, they said, you know, it's a great land. We can do it. But the, the ten unbelievers, oh, yeah, they're walled cities. You know, we're a bunch of nomads. We can't do it. So they ended up in unbelief wandering around the Sinai for 40 years. But now, um, Joshua's not taking he's, he's got two people. They're unnamed, these two spies. He sends these two spies to check them out. And uh, they go into the city of Jericho, and no doubt they were spotted because I suspect their clothing and their, their appearance kind of indicated they weren't local people. And the king of Jericho hears about them, these Israelites out there that we've been hearing about, that horde of people uh, have sent spies to check out our defenses. So, where did these two spies end up? They ended up at a house of ill repute. Rahab, the prostitute. Now, I'm sure people were used to seeing strange men coming in and out of Rahab's house. You understand. But, these two spies, these two spies were cited and were noted. And I, say, I suspect it had something to do with uh, their clothing and whatever else people recognized that they weren't local inhabitants. So the king of Jericho sends word to Rahab. And he says to her, bring out the men that have come 
to you and have entered your house because they have come to spy out the whole land. And this is all in Joshua chapter 2. Now, this lady, by the way, was very smart. And uh, you're going to notice that uh, she, wasn't, she wasn't truthful when the king confronted her about these two men. Um, she said this, uh, the two men that have come, uh, they've, they've left. And I don't know where, where they went, but uh, you, you need to uh, send, send some guys after them, a posse, uh, to catch up with them before they go, they go back to their camp. And so that's indeed what the king did. He sends a posse after to catch these two guys. Meanwhile, what does she do? She hid the two men up on her upstairs, covered them over with some flax. So she, she didn't tell the truth. Now, here's an example of a lie in the Bible. There are, there are lies in the Bible. Here's one. Is it ever okay to not tell the truth if you were living in the country of Holland in 1940 and you were sheltering some Jews in your house and the Nazis or their collaborators came by and said, do you have any Jews here? We, we you hear you have some Jews. What would you say if you were hiding Jews in your attic? No. Okay. Um, I should have turned off my phone. Obviously, somebody doesn't know me calling me at this time of day. <laughs> and what I do could be my daughter. Could be my daughter. All right, so uh, she says, I don't know where they went, but uh, no doubt they left, and uh, you need to go after them. Now, she tells the two guys, after she hides them up in her roof, uh, she's going to let them down from a window down the wall, and she tells them to go up and hide in the hills for three days. So in other words, don't go right back. Go hide for three days, and then go back. So that's what they did. This woman was pretty smart. So they go back and, they, of course, they tell uh, Joshua what Rahab, the prostitute, did for them. Now, she negotiated also. She's negotiator. She says, you know, we have heard, she says, we have heard, I know that the Lord has given this land to you, and this has caused a great fear upon us. We have heard how the Lord had dried up the water of the Red Sea when you came out of Egypt. Now, how did, how did Rahab know that? Must have been on the 6 o'clock evening news, right? <laughs> Stuff happens all around the world and you hear about it. Somewhere or another, the word had gotten to the people in Jericho of the miracles that God had done for the Israelites up to this point. And so there was great fear on their part, even though they were hiding there behind the walled cities. So she had... Faith to believe that the God of the Israelites, who had been doing this for them, she wanted to be on their side. And she says, listen, anything I ask is that uh, you spare me and my family. You spare me and my family. So <laughs> the spy said to her, our lives for your lives. It's a pretty good lie. Our lives for your lives. And so, um, indeed, she let them down with a rope from her window, and they were able to flee up to the hills and then go back. They reported this to Joshua. But to indicate to the Israelites, Rahab and Joshua said to people, we're going to spare this woman because of what she did for the two spies. How to know where Rahab, there's going to be the scarlet thread from her window. And preachers have latched onto this and said, really, what we have is a scarlet thread the whole way through the Bible of things that God has done in deliverance of his people. And we can see how God has indeed spared people, people of faith. And, of course, the scarlet thread is a reference as well to, of course, Jesus Christ and his shed blood for us. So, 
Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31 says that by faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, and she did more than just welcome them. She hid them. She gave them instructions of how they could escape and get back. She was not killed, as were the others who were disobedient or unbelieving. She did believe in the God of the Israelites and what their God could do for her and spare her. And indeed, he did exactly that. Not only that, here's an amazing thing. She ended up with the Israelites and became a descendant of Jesus the Messiah. You can read about this in Matthew chapter 1, in the genealogy of Jesus. Her name is mentioned among all the other names that are listed as the descendants of Jesus. And by the way, to me, one of the proofs that the Bible is the Bible, the Word of God, if I was writing the Bible, there are some things I would not include in the Bible. It's kind of embarrassing about God's people. But God puts his things there for a reason. It's for us to learn a lesson because all, all of us are sinners. And so we can see how God indeed he cares more about our present and our future than he does about our past. He cares more about our present and our future than he does the past. He's willing to forgive and pardon us from our sins if indeed we repent. So we read here in Matthew chapter 1. It says, Solomon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Rahab, there's her name. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. You remember Ruth? She was the Moabitess. And Jesse, the father of King David. David, who was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Who was Uriah's wife? Bathsheba. Bathsheba. So some interesting names and women's names generally not found in Jewish genealogies. But what we see here by the mention of Rahab here in the list of the people in Jesus that he descended from, we can see that indeed God is willing to forgive us and forgive us and pardon us of our past, even if it includes prostitution and adultery. Even if it includes prostitution and adultery. Faith in God and repentance leads to forgiveness and can be used in God's plan for our lives and the lives of others. Your past, your past, once forgiven, can be used to encourage and help others dealing with maybe the same things to also be forgiven and pardoned. Now, one of the issues I have today is not that uh, God is willing to accept sinners, but people need to repent. People need to repent. The same call is the same call that's gone down through the history of the church. Believe, repent, and follow. Believe, repent, and follow. It isn't just okay to say, well, you're okay, I'm okay, everything's okay, but if we've done something that is sinful, God expects us to repent, which means to have a change of heart and to turn from that. Rahab, yes, was once a prostitute, but now she became a person of faith and becomes an ancestor of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Here we see, indeed, the grace of God, the grace of God that is willing to forgive and pardon even somebody like prostitute Rahab incorporating her into the people of God, the Israelites, and using her even in such a great way that she becomes a descendant of the Messiah. Do you have this kind of faith, the faith that we've been talking about here in the book of Hebrews? If so, you too can be forgiven of great things and be used by God for his eternal purposes, not only yours, but the salvation of of others. So we've had three, maybe even I mentioned four now because we added a story about the passing through the Jordan River. Three more, four more lessons the power of faith when it is put into action. 
All these people, by the way, as we're going through the book of Hebrews, it says, by faith, and it's by faith, it describes what they did. By faith, they did this. By faith, they did that. Faith that leads to action is what God responds to. So, Moses had his staff. The waters parted. The people passed through the Red Sea. When the priest's feet hit the water, the Jordan River stopped. They passed through again on dry land. They marched around the city of Jericho seven times on the seventh day. Trumpets blasted. The people gave a great shout, and the walls came a-tumbling down. That was a great offertory. And then we have the story about Rahab, of how God spared her. Why? Because of how she took care of the spies. Hid them. Just ask that, indeed, when you come into your, the victory, just spare me and my family. And indeed, her faith is what not only saved her in this life, but also granted her and saved her, incorporated her in the people of God. And so we have these lessons to be inspired by today. If you ever feel trapped, if you ever feel the walls are blocking you, if you ever feel threatened by some situation, have faith to believe that indeed, through faith and through action on your part, following the direction of the Lord, you indeed also can experience miraculous things and then be able to give honor and glory to God the Father for his deliverance to you, not only in this life, but for the life to come. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for recording for us these lessons from history here in the Old Testament, cited again in the New Testament. Theological history for sure. Recording of how you've acted, things you've done in the past. Meant to encourage us in our lives today. We live in very difficult and challenging times. And there are many times a day that we might feel trapped by circumstances, walled in, uh, confronted with impossible matters. Give us faith in these times to be able to keep moving forward doing the things that you would have us to do, yes, for your honor and glory, for our salvation and deliverance, but far more importantly, for us to know you and the power of faith, not only in this life, but as well for the life to come. We pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. And now before our joys and concerns, we have hymn number 442, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, number 442.
Jim went along with the sermon. Thank you, Karen. Pat, joys and concerns. And we're collecting the microphone as we're all collecting our thoughts. Who? Okay, you got one right there. I wanted to say a concerns prayers for uh, Wendy uh, and her family and her mother, Beverly. And uh, I know her situation because I've been there. I also wanted to give thanks to Wendy and the lunch staff, the job that they do there cooking, their politeness, their courteous. I always thank them after every meal, but they're really wonderful in the whole senior center. They're, they're great people. This so I appreciate that. You. Oh, good. Beatrice. Uh, I would like to thank God for everything he does for us, especially for what he has been doing for me lately. <laughs> he moved my mountain and Actually, a couple days ago, um, a friend that I have, a little old lady, that she's 92 years old, somebody else told me that she apparently had had two small strokes, mini strokes, and ended up in the hospital. So then I called her daughter, and she tells me, yeah, she started having blurred, slurred speech, so she called 911. And so yesterday I called again to ask, and her name is June, the lady. She answered the phone, and her voice was completely normal. And she goes, oh, could you call me a little later? I got company now. Of course, I said. Then I called at nighttime, and the daughter answered. Uh, but the whole thing about it is that when I found out what had happened to her, I prayed to God. And I was like, please, 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 let her be OK. And. There he goes again, answering, answering, you know, and I was like, wow, talk about answering my prayers, you know, and I'm sure it wasn't just my prayers, whole family must have been praying and all that, but to me, it just felt like uh, he was showing me, look, you know, you ask, I give, mm -hmm. you know, that's how I took it. And that's the way you should take it. Yeah, and I would also like to ask for prayers for my daughter and her family. Thank you. Anthony. He's got his hand up several times. <laughs> uh, my sister Evelyn has asked, uh, just wanted to thank the church for prayers for her friend Joan. Joan, as of this morning, made it down to uh, Georgia safely. Um, and Joan is elderly and has been moving back to Texas. So she just wanted the church to be aware that she made it down to Georgia. And Joan asked for, you know, to thank the church for their prayers, for travel mercies. Yeah, first of all, we want to know why anybody would want to move to Georgia. <laughs> Do you Peaches. ever watch the Weather Channel? Yeah. Pe peaches. No. Okay, maybe. Yeah. They don't get flooded out. Um, thank you for all the prayers for my cousin. She had a great 95th birthday on the 7th, and one of my Milford friends brought me there so we could bring her things. I want continued prayers, so please, um, for Norma and Wendy, two of the strongest women I, I know. But on a sad side, but um, one of my coworkers from the Kennedy Center, um, who I work with in HR, her daughter passed away at age 33. And she has a small seven month old baby girl and a 10 year old boy. Miracle is the girl and Caden is the boy. So they're in a tough situation. I just found out last night, but it happened on February 11th. So I know that they might be on the news. There's some GoFundMe pages. They're doing their best, but just, Prayers is great too. Thank you. Happy birthday. I took a prayer shawl for uh, my son's mother-in-law, Betty Crenshaw, and um, she, she couldn't thank the church enough for the prayer shawl. Second thing, uh, Pastor Larry from First Church <coughs> in uh, Derby, he's got to go in for open heart surgery and it's supposed to take eight hours. Wow. And uh, the week before last, his wife, Doreen, just had a stent put in and she got pneumonia. And uh, not being able to work, they've, uh, had a little, they've got a little orchestra. Steve uh, played with him 
and uh, they can't work, so they have no money coming in. So pray that something comes in, and all their family is down in Tennessee. So. I have a joy next Sunday. Tom and I and my family is going away, and we will be back the 24th, and the 24th is Tom and my anniversary. I'd just like prayers for my husband who's at the VA hospital. Um, we had to take him by ambulance on Friday, and hopefully he'll be home sometime this week. That's what he told me this morning. And last night I fell and smashed my knee. So just pray that it's not broken. I just would like to ask for prayer for my um, nephew's mother on Friday, this coming Friday, the 15th. She's having her rotator cuff replaced. I guess she had it repaired, and she told me that after you have it repaired and you heard it, you get it replaced. So that she'll come through that well. And um, the other thing is, is that if we could all just remember to pray that the Lord sends families with children and that we should pray for VBS, even though it's a year away, that God will start working now and that if we bring the children, the parents will come, obviously, because they're bringing the children. That's a wonderful prayer. And then one, one, one quick other oh, thing. Sure. Is, um, one of my, our former pastor from quite a while ago, his wife's um, mother just passed away. If it could be with the fi prayer for the family. She, I guess she had a heart attack at 95, but Still, you know, it's your mother. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be all. All right, thank you very much for these prayers, the requests, and uh, we'll take them to the Lord. So, Wendy uh, tells us that uh, Bev is still in ICU at Yale. So, we are praying that she's able to get back to rehab again. And also, um, Joe Whalen, I believe, is having uh, surgery. surgery this week. Thursday. Thursday. Okay. So pray for Joe and uh, Bev, and uh, she pray for Joe. Always also pray for Linda. So we have a lot of of the prayer. And talking about uh, children, one of the reasons we do the egg hunt and the Halloween candy is just basically reaching out to the community, and we've been doing that. So as so. We we put a sign out there that says Vacation Bible School Run. We're going to have children here. We believe that. So we've been laying the groundwork and reaching out. Uh, there's many many children in this area, and uh, the stories that uh, I shared here this morning were stories that I learned at Vacation Bible School, in Sunday school, and that's what's really missing today in a lot of our society and country. People are biblically illiterate biblically illiterate, and then left up to just dealing with the nasty now and now, struggling along on their own, not having the faith, the biblical faith, to guide them and their families. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the lessons of faith that we have in the scripture, for its direction to us in our lives even here and now in 2024. And so we pause to pray for these situations that we're shared today, not to inform you, but to share and inform one another as we join together in prayer as you command us to pray, uh, praying and believing that indeed you not only hear, but you can answer, and your answer is always in the most appropriate time and fashion. And so we do pray for these today, now especially I lift up uh, Bev and, and Joe, along with these other names that we've heard of this morning. And so now we conclude this time of prayer by praying the prayer that your son taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who 
art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses, those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Divine us the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for now and forever. Amen. Amen. And I might uh, also ask that uh, as we pray, uh, this past week I had two funerals. One was of a 38-year-old young man that died of a heart attack. His father died of a heart attack at age 37, 25 years ago. But there were hundreds of people at this funeral and again at the graveside service. And uh, from just looking at the appearance of mostly a lot of young people, I share the word as I always do at funerals. And so we just pray that the word that we shared will be a seed, a seed that will bring forth uh, faith and salvation. Can we stand and sing together for our parting hymn, number 43. He's got the whole world in his hands, number 43. to the first verse. So let's do the first verse again. There's a coda. All right. Lead us choir. God the Lord. So aren't you glad you got up early this morning? Yeah. Came today. You get to hear the walls of the Jericho fall down. You got the whole. You got to see the Moses rod, three thousand years old. So, um, ah, yeah, very, yeah, yep. Yeah. So uh, today uh, we have one more week after this week. So Miss Debbie has been working this choir really hard to get ready for the Palm Sunday service. So I'm going to ask choir members. Scoot over there, get your food, and get back in here. All right? So give the choir first dibs over there in the line of the food so they can eat and come back and have our rehearsal. Spread the word. Palm Sunday, we're going to have a full packed church. And uh, we got overflow space. You can join uh, Kathy and, and Tom over here in the fellowship hall with the big screen. And we can just have a glorious time on Palm Sunday. All right? Heavenly Father, ask your blessing upon us this week that we might be a blessing, trusting indeed that you have, yes, the whole world in your hands, a world that is very troubled, but you asked us to be your messengers of peace, and we pray that you enable us to do that. In Christ's name.